All right, I think we'll get started. Uh, firstly, I wanted to begin by thanking everyone for joining us here today. My name is Matt Murphy. I am the Vice President of Commercial Banking here at IBIS World. Uh, the title of today's webinar is Potential Bottlenecks to Recovery, the Supply Chain Riddle and Credit Risk, What You Should Really Worry About. Um, before we jump into it, though, just wanted to give a little background on the impetus for this webinar, as well as for a white paper that we've published uh, that we'll be talking about today. Uh, essentially, over the past several months, IBIS World's commercial banking clients have reached out to us, uh, as well as some of the banking regulators, I should say, um, but expressing concern about things like supply chain disruptions to their clients' industries, uh, inflation and credit risk, how those play into some of these supply chain disruptions. Uh, I think it's also worth mentioning that we've received a lot of questions from our non-banking clients as well. That includes accounting firms, investment firms, manufacturers, procurement professionals, all expressing some of the same concerns both in the U.S. as well as Canada uh, about how some of these supply chain disruptions are affecting the industries that matter most to them. Uh, before we dive into uh, the white paper and everything. I do want to say this is nothing new to IBIS World. Uh, we reacted pretty quickly during the Great Recession in terms of updating our industry research reports to reflect, you know, that major shock to the U.S. economy. Uh, when COVID started back in 2020, uh, we worked tirelessly to make sure that our industry research reports were updated and reflecting how COVID-19, uh, both at, you know, the, the state and local regulation level, as well as the supply chain level, uh, were impacting industries across the U.S. economy. We even rolled out a COVID-19 impact tool, a local data tool that a lot of our clients uh, have been using to help understand and map how their clients and customers industries are, are being impacted here. Uh, so now that we've been getting more supply chain specific questions, we, we've undertaken a, a pretty major research project that's taken about two months or so to complete. Uh, and that is the, the publishing of this, what we're calling bottleneck report. Uh, two of the gentlemen joining me today have been instrumental in, in publishing this. That's Rick Bozinski, our Senior VP and Chief Economist. Uh, he's joined by Robert Miles, who is our uh, Senior Strategic Market Research Analyst. Uh, before I hand things over to them, I will note that the chat box is open in this webinar. So any questions that you have, please feel free to drop them into the chat box. Uh, we do have limited time today, so I can't say that we'll get to every single question, but just know that once we wrap things up a little later on, uh, everyone here will be receiving an email that has a link to the recording as well as a copy of the white paper. Uh, so do not hesitate to respond to those emails with any questions that you have or any requests that you have. Um, we're happy to answer them. Uh, so uh, with that being said, I'll hand things over to Rick. Thanks, Matt. As mentioned, although this project is U.S. bank-centric, there are many lessons to be learned by other verticals. So why is this topic so important to IBIS World clients? Well, we're facing a new shock. First, we had COVID-19 and now this supply chain debacle. So from a bank perspective, do your models work? Can your grading systems account for shocks? Are your policymakers in risk management and business development attuned to all this? These are tough tasks but we're going to take a shot at them. In terms of our objectives, what are the key risk indicators that define bottlenecks, the industries they affect, and which industries are interrelated along the supply chain? This is all about significant potential bottlenecks to economic recovery, not just global value chain bottlenecks. Also, which industries, sectors, or subsectors are most impacted what is the degree of vulnerability and how might these resonate along the supply chain? And perhaps most importantly, what are the transitory versus more permanent forces? In essence, which forces will linger, which will evaporate? So here's a flow chart of our study. Remember that supply chain issues are indeed an important part of the story, but they cannot be analyzed in isolation of other potent key risk indicators. So we're going to try to identify some of these economic forces, talk about their direct impacts on industry performance, and then the indirect impacts through the supply chain. Another objective that we took on is to try to define a procedure to deal with all of these challenges. So in our bottleneck report, we offer a sort of guidance or some suggestions 
after chatting with some of our clients. We also developed a simple spreadsheet tool that Rob Miles will talk about in a few minutes. For starters, we can't forget the forces and risks that were in play before COVID-19. Here's a core list. Stuff like labor shortages, trade tensions, overly aggressive fiscal and monetary policies, the monumental rise in government, household, and corporate debt, all related to interest rate risk and the chasing of higher yields in a low interest rate world. And of course, commercial real estate risks. Wrote a paper in February 2020 in the RMA Journal that I co-authored with Kent Kirby and Dev Strychek. You may want to check this out. And lest we forget some of the fundamentals that are often neglected in times of crisis, the fog of the pandemic war, for example. I'm thinking about concentration risk, which happens to be one of my pet peeves. You may want to check out an article that I co-wrote with Kent Kirby that was published in the May 2019 RMA Journal. The article discusses concentration risk mappings, enterprise risk management correlations, and scorecard engineering. Check it out. So you know what we did? We created a beware of list. And we were looking for key risk indicators that create bottlenecks, disrupt supply chains, jeopardize an economic recovery, thereby stressing credit risk. And by the way, you can get that flask, I believe, at Walmart. So here we go. Beware of labor shortages. Those are talent gaps for skilled and semi-skilled workers. This is perhaps the most serious of our concerns, and these gaps were prevalent before the pandemic. Stress sectors include logistics and transportation, construction, think of the infrastructure bill, by the way, who's going to engineer, who's going to build, and also the healthcare industry, where COVID-19 has amplified the stress. Also look for opportunities where clients are engaged in on-the-job training programs. This might be a new wave for the American economy. Beware of innate supply chain vulnerabilities. Three factors here. Producers, sellers with complex global value chains like autos are most vulnerable. And where it can be expensive to find alternative suppliers and when onshoring or nearshoring costs are prohibitive. Also, there can be contractual stickiness that inhibits supplier switching. Read the report. There's much, much more on the whole chip shortage dilemma. A chip is not just a chip. Beware of industries that are dependent on exports or imports, international trade. The U.S. does indeed export goods. Many are high value added products. Check out this chart. We're number two in the world. Now, we all know that relations with China remain tense, but as well, the rest of the world has become more nationalistic, protective, and hence trade is very vulnerable to economic downturns. By the way, China provides 80% of rare earths that are imported into the United States. These are in every electronic device and product you can think of. As an important aside, don't forget about trade in services. America is the global leader. Did you know that? Items include business financial services, travel, transportation, logistics, and intellectual property, royalties. Think about Apple. These totaled $2.8 trillion in 2020, one-third of our total exports. Here, there are risks and opportunities. Take a look. Beware of businesses in emerging or declining phases of industry life cycles. Check out this chart. Emerging industries, think of the dot-com boom bust. I know heaps of bankers that lost their shirts in this frenzy. Industries in decline, think of department stores, shopping malls, and the so-called Amazon effect. Scary stuff indeed. Beware of industries that are notoriously volatile. 
Volatility, I define it as the lack of predictability of an industry's performance. And it's often the bane of risk management, a serious risk management malpractice. Here's a short list using IBIS World's early warning system metrics. I'll leave this on for a few seconds. For premium IBIS World clients, check this out. If there is a holy grail of risk metrics, lo and behold, here you go. And beware of intertwined key risk indicators. We ran a stagflation scenario using our scenario builder risk model to test the sensitivity of industry risk at a NAICS level for the 700 industries we analyze. This is all in the bottleneck report. It's a bit too much to articulate today, but we know other clients are considering this scenario as a credible downside risk. And finally, here's the sad and sorry reality and the cause of ongoing trepidation and uncertainty. Beware of the ultimate of downside risks, the virus and its variants. We're far from out of the woods. Recall that pundits said that we would be on our way to recovery late summer, by late summer 2020. Think about that. With that, I'll turn it over to Rob Miles as he'll walk you through the supply chain spreadsheet. Rob, in your court. Thanks for that, Rick. What we've done is distilled down the analytical framework laid out in this presentation into a simple spreadsheet that scores supply chain risk exposure. The layout of the spreadsheet is centered on NAICS classifications and is designed to support decisions based on this type of segmentation. Each code is related to a set of attributes that help form a scoring mechanism to compare industries. So why start with energy classifications? The value is twofold. The coding structure allows for a straightforward mapping of these attributes to individual components in a portfolio. And the hierarchy allows for efficient rollups and grouping. So it's really plug and play with the portfolio. Beyond the data mapping, these industry classifications provide a strong foundation to start defining exposures and priorities. There's meaningful information in the definition of an industry, and those are defined by structural factors that delineate industries, which are the same structural factors that can help us define exposures to supply chain risks. So when we start at the industry level, it allowed us to look at these factors and how they relate to realized operating conditions. It's with that in mind that the scoring system was devised for the spreadsheet. And in the case of supply chain bottleneck risks, we have six attributes in a composite score. We won't get into the underlying process for calculating these scores, but in general, it's a feature scaling exercise that just produces comparable metrics across all attributes and gives us a one through nine score, with nine being the highest exposure. The scoring system and the spreadsheet is designed as a heuristic for defining priorities and is best followed from left to right. So if we start with column one, we can look at labor shortage risk. So we're using IBIS World data in the five years leading up to the COVID crisis. We're looking at average wage per employee and wages over revenue as a ratio. This helps us define a labor index that can help us look at market tightness and potential shortages of labor at the industry level. These are adjusted using an index of industries that are highly exposed to a need for STEM labor and helps us scale up the risk exposure based on this perceived um, potential shortage of labor. Next, we look at supply chain risk. Three of IBIS World's proprietary measures are used here. Industry globalization, capital intensity, and profit. Globalization provides a direct assessment of the degree to which an industry is exposed to global conditions, thereby exposure to localized disruptions that can reverberate through the U.S. industry. Very simply, higher globalization relates to higher risk of supply chain disruption. Similar metric in capital intensity. 
we're looking at industries that may require investment to diversify supplier sources in the face of disruption with a high level of capital investment that they already have in their business. In short, a more capital intensive industry has more potential for exposure risk during a supply chain disruption. And then profitability acts as a marker of relative strength in the value chain. Higher profit implies greater control over pricing. In our scoring metric, this acts as a scaler to look at industries that may be able to withstand other forms of supply chain disruption. And then importantly, all of these metrics don't really cover all the potential supply chain disruptions. So we've added in a qualitative adjustment looking at the potential for the bullwhip effect um, in the wholesale and retail trade. So NAICS 4.2, 4.4, and 4.5 have a qualitative adjustment built into the score. Now let's look at trade dependence risk, which is an index based on the ratio of imports over domestic demand and exports over revenue, which act as a proxy for an industry's overall trade exposure. This index is scored one through nine using the same methodology used in Ibis World's industry risk rating model. Now, this factor is related to the supply chain risk in the other column, but it provides us with a different measure of relative exposure to external markets. This measurement of actual imports and exports allows us to define industries that have high exposure to the need to have access to export markets. Higher trade dependence relates to higher risk in the model. Next, we can look at two factors that are key to identifying the magnitude of potential supply chain risks. Life cycle and industry volatility aren't necessarily directly related to something like a bottleneck at the industry level, but they help us to identify the potential for increased downside in the event of a bottleneck or a similar supply chain disruption. The life cycle defines whether or not an industry is in the growth stage, the mature stage, or the decline stage. The decline stage helps us to look at cases where an industry may have a magnified effect in the face of a bottleneck disruption versus where a growth stage may mitigate those effects. Industry volatility takes Ibis World's industry risk rating and looks at the through the cycle variation in that scoring metric. Now this is based on our industry early warning system model and looks at the standard deviation of risk from 2006 to 2021. And this is a key metric and looking at the potential for downside at the industry level. More volatile industries, whether or not they are directly affected by a supply chain or they're in a growth stage, or generally have positive attributes, have the potential for large swings in risk outcomes. And that magnifies what we want to look at with this measurement. Now, finally, we can wrap it up with our other key risk indicators. And this is what was outlined uh, in an earlier slide by Rick, where we ran a stagflation scenario on all of our industries and measured the sensitivity to that scenario based on industry relations to key macro indicators. Higher sensitivity to that scenario, a case where prices are going up and output is flat, help us define industries that are going to be exposed to a potential broader macro downside in the case of a broad supply chain disruption. Now we can wrap it up with the final column, which is the average of all the preceding columns. It's a simple average and it is primarily there to help us set red flags at the industry level when metrics exceed the average threshold. Now, an important distinction to make with this spreadsheet when compared with other things like our industry risk rating system is that it's structural in its perspective. These inputs are there to provide a scoring system that identifies inherent industry risk factors. Therefore, the update schedule of this spreadsheet will be longer and will reflect the measurement of structural factors. And that's it for me. So I'm going to hand it back over to Matt to wrap us up. OK, so we've received a few questions um, at this point. Uh, the first one, I think, is best suited for you, Rob.
Uh, the first question is, we're an enterprise client with Ibis World that's been using the COVID-19 tool. It's been very useful in shaping our credit policies for more than a year. This new supply chain tool looks very relevant and easy to implement via mapping tables, just like the COVID tool. Curious if we should phase out the COVID tool and rely just on the bottleneck spreadsheet. A simple answer here is to just keep using both, but be strategic in how you're using both tools and make sure they apply to specifically what you're looking at, right? As, as Rick had mentioned, the pandemic still looms large, right? And while related, bottleneck risks and COVID risks enter into industry conditions via different channels and have different outcomes at the industry level. So the COVID tool, just by virtue of how government responses have trended, will become naturally less dynamic as time rolls on. However, it still provides a very straightforward way of looking at different types of scenarios where different metrics related to the COVID crisis, thinking about social distancing or consumer behavior type metrics uh, can affect different industries in different ways. So if Delta continues and keeps seeing other strains and these strains and the ensuing uh, pandemic affect consumer behavior, the COVID tool remains relevant. So the two metrics looking at bottleneck risk and discrete COVID risks can be used in conjunction, right? And ignoring one and only looking at the other can miss key factors that, you know, can be seen from COVID analysis versus supply chain bottleneck analysis. And it's important to understand the interplay between the two, right? And how the risks of COVID and the risks of bottlenecks can magnify each other. Great, thanks, Rob. Uh, these next couple questions I think are good for you, Rick. Uh, the first question is, why is historical volatility so important in the world we live in today when it's unpredictable events that stress our decision-making? And the second question is, and I think this has been mentioned to the rogue wave economic risks that you mentioned, in your opinion, which worries you the most? Interesting questions, Matt. Let me start out with volatility. You know, there are basically two types of volatility that exist, at least in my opinion, that must be disentangled. The first I'll call dynamic, perhaps related to a particular shock that could be the pandemic or the supply chain disruptions in the current context. This type disturbs a very broad range of industries, hardly any that go totally unscathed. But by the way, as soon as these forces that led to the shock dissipate, the effects begin to lessen, they evaporate. Nonetheless, obviously the impacts of any shock influences sectors unevenly and can last for a very long period of time. Think of the recovery from the Great Recession. But the point uh, I'm trying to make is that dynamic shocks that cause volatility are transitory, almost cyclical in nature. The second type of volatility is structural, much along the lines of what Rob Miles mentioned when he discussed Ibis World supply chain tool. These are, as I mentioned, industries that are historically volatile and may not have strong correlations with either economic or credit cycles. The OCC, by the way, we would call these independent industries because they can take a turn for the worse even in good economic times. So if you're a lender, think of risk pricing. When you read our white paper, check out the table in the beware of volatility section that I actually presented today. Regarding the second question on what key indicators worry me the most, I'm thinking interest rates. And I have been worried about this for decades. The phrase record low interest rates has been around since Alan Greenspan was the head of the Fed. Our economy is basically addicted to cheap credit. Think of small businesses living on thin margins that depend on short-term credit. Even small rises in the cost of credit can lead to a rash of business failures. And the current debate whether recent inflationary forces are temporary or may persist has indeed complicated the decision-making of the Federal Reserve. Think about market risk and equities. And this is all related to the broader picture concerning fiscal policy and the budget, taxes, 
the infrastructure bill, etc. Matt, I'm going to turn it back to you to wrap up. Okay, thanks, Rick. Uh, we're going to wrap things up there. As I mentioned earlier, uh, once we're done, we will send out to everyone a link to this recording as well as uh, a copy of the white paper that we discussed today. If you have any additional questions, do not hesitate to respond to that email with those questions. We can definitely answer them for you. Uh, if anybody on here would like a demonstration of the supply chain tool or of the IBIS World database in general, uh, whether you're an IBIS World client currently or you're new to us, we're, we're happy to do that. Um, but that does it for us today. Uh, hope everyone takes care. Thanks.